Yeah, so our next speaker um, will be Igor Pekovsky, um, and he'll tell us about low energy interface of quantum and gravity. Well, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I really want to thank the organizers, um, not just for inviting me, which I really appreciate, but also organizing this extremely interesting workshop, I have to say, now on the last day. It's like the, the breadth and span of topics is very interesting and I think very topical. Uh, so I should really been enjoying it so far very much. Um, and uh, here, uh, what I uh, want to talk about is the so-called low energy interface of quantum and gravity. And my own background is in uh, theory, in quantum optics theory uh, and quantum information theory. But the last decade or so, or even longer, I've been mostly interested on the interface between quantum systems and quantum control on the one hand, and gravitational phenomena and possibly quantum gravity signatures on the other hand. Um, and so this talk is a bit of my, my own maybe subjective perspective on this field um, and some results therein. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some um, of, you know, a small selection of results that we have obtained with collaborators along the way. Um, okay, so uh, uh, briefly, as I mentioned, uh, in my group, so we are interested in, uh, on the one hand, kind of bread and butter quantum optics or uh, quantum AMO physics. Um, and in particular, what's, uh, what's interesting is the, the wide range of available novel systems, hybrid systems and just novel quantum systems that can be controlled in different regimes um, of physical scales. And so this spans from optomechanical systems, um, it can be uh, 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 atomic metasurfaces that we recently looked at, uh, atomic clocks, of course, atomic fountains, many things that we heard here as well. Uh, so this is on the one hand, I think, very exciting topic on by itself. But at the same time, uh, there is uh, the second uh, kind of strong interest uh, of mine, um, which is uh, the study of uh, gravity related effects at the interface with low energy quantum systems. Um, and this could be, uh, you know, novel phenomena that appear when one in includes gravity, possibilities of novel experiments experiments to test some models, such as we just heard, for example, this uh, test of some uh, possible holographic principle or, or, or other ideas. And also Gedanken experiments uh, or just conceptual questions that uh, elucidate some of the foundational issues when we overlay uh, quantum and gravity. And so what I think uh, for me personally is mostly exciting is that there's a very close interlink between those two. Um, so on the one hand, uh, if one has these new systems and they push the boundaries in entirely new scales and regimes and precision, that allows you to start thinking about these ideas and how they really uh, affect uh, experiments and could be probed. And you know, this is of course the motivation for this workshop. And it also goes the other way, uh, which is that uh, studying these systems uh, or these kind of questions about gravity uh, give some novel ideas of where these systems need to push and what kind of motivations there is for really truly fundamental physics uh, and really explore regimes of physics that we don't know much about. So I really uh, kind of enjoyed this interface. And just as a side remark, if you know any students or postdocs that are interested in that, uh, we in my group probably have uh, open positions uh, from fall as well. So please, you know, uh, would be nice if they reach out. Okay, so uh, here let me just give a, a very brief kind of a summary how this fits the slow energy interface uh, with uh, between quantum and gravity. Uh, so this is taken from uh, yeah just my PhD thesis from for, from many years ago, uh, and this is just kind of a very simple uh, diagram of how physical theories developed. And on the red here, in the red we have uh, classical theories, and the culmination of them being general relativity about a hundred years ago, which combined many of the concepts into a classical uh, framework of GR. And then on the other hand here we have quantum mechanics, and that has of course you know culminated in uh, the quantum field theory, which encompasses all interactions we know except gravity. Now, uh, the interface between those two is very interesting, and there's different aspects of it. And this is, I think, what, I, what I'm trying to stress here. Uh, so for, for that, let me just distinguish conceptually, even though they're interlinked, but conceptually here are two things. One is the notion of test particles, so geodesic motion on a curved background spacetime. And the other is the uh, dynamics of gravity itself and the gravitational field, which is governed by Einstein's equations. So if we just look at test systems, uh, but then we can combine it uh, or we can understand it in some uh, limit uh, in the context of quantum field theory. And that's, of course, the very big field of quantum field theory and curved space time. And there's new effects that arise. So we can put Q of T on a curved background uh, space time and then study it. 
Um, and very similarly, and, and this is, I think, one way to, to, to phrase it, very similarly, we can do something with quantum optical systems, AMO systems. So we can place low energy quantum systems um, on a curved background space time. So on the one hand, we treat the AMO systems actually non-relativistically because we're interested in atoms, optomechanics, um, uh, molecules and so forth, uh, but we place it on a curved background space time and include some GR effects, uh, which then can lead to novel phenomena. And this is what I'll talk about a little bit here. And then there's uh, other interfaces, uh, for example, the linearized uh, limit of gravity. And in fact, that can be quantized and that's known since the thirties, uh, since uh, uh, Matvei Bronstein actually, um, uh, 34, I think. Um, and with this a framework that we can uh, study. Um, and there's also very interesting questions uh, related to uh, experiments and that many we have heard also here so far. So that's uh, kind of a combination of these different concepts with um, quantum mechanics. And then going beyond that, starts to be difficult, but there's one very fruitful avenue, which is uh, what's, what I would call quantum gravity phenomenology. And this is trying to study maybe some expected behavior, uh, like what we just said about holography, uh, and see how it might fit into uh, some of the experimental frameworks that we have. And it's based on some maybe speculative suggestions, uh, but it's trying to incorporate uh, things into known frameworks and uh, try to find experimental signatures because we have a lack of the full theory that can really give us definite answers. And this full theory is giving us definite answers, quantum theory of gravity. Well, that's of course the holy grail, uh, but that is, uh, you know, that is uh, beyond my intellectual capability. Uh, and in fact, it's a very interesting question, but so far it has not been much focused on experiments. And so I think the experimental overlap is really in these three uh, parts here, linearized quantum gravity, quantum gravity phenology, and quantum mechanics of curve space-time. And this is something that I've been very interested in in the last uh, decade. And so this is, I think, where really theory and experiment go together. And there's a lot of interesting questions to explore. So just to give you some examples, if you have novel quantum systems and then new insights to gravity, Gravity and this uh, range, there's new questions that arise in possible experiments. So, for example, a very, you know, very famous and now very topical, of course, and we heard much about it, and we will hear in the next talk by Anima, uh, 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 sorry, Anupam, <laughs> I apologize, uh, but um, so we'll hear about this, of course, in more detail. And this is this test of uh, uh, gravity as a mediator of entanglement. And, and that it can tell us something about the possible quantum nature of gravity. And so there's been some proposals about it in recent years, some more recently, and also, also some very interesting proposals by uh, Jacob Taylor, who we heard now uh, many years ago about possible maybe classical channel of gravity. So that's one example. Uh, there are some you know, ideas that we had, not so close to experiments, but about trying to study the quantum nature of causality. And if one can maybe perform some type of Bell experiment in order to see if the time itself has to be a quantum notion without definite, uh, definite uh, features. Um, and then there's, uh, for example, also Brad Vilcek was just mentioned, uh, here's a very interesting uh, recent result on quantum noise of gravitons. And even though it's far away from experimental uh, observations to date, it's very interesting to think about this uh, and what kind of shot noise of, of, of gravitational waves would look like. Okay, and then in terms of quantum gravity phenomenology, in terms of uh, speculative theory, I think the most famous example is the gravitational wave function collapse, the idea that maybe quantum mechanics breaks down at some scale because of the inclusion of gravity. Uh, and there's been actually many proposals, and I think this is one of the starting points, I would say, of this field, uh, where people show that you can actually do experiments to try and probe it about 20 years ago already, and there's been since, uh, you know, many efforts in this direction. Um, then we had an example where we showed there's a, something entirely different you can probe with optomechanics, and namely a possible uh, generalization of the uncertainty principle, which has been proposed in the context of many models of quantum gravity, and under some uh, conditions and, and interpretations, it would have a signature in optomechanical systems as well, which one can constrain. Uh, other ideas are, for example, quantum fold and so forth, uh, that, that Beck and Jacob Beckenstein, for example, proposed to test. So this is just a small selection of things. And of course, you know, we heard many more in this, uh, in this talk, but just to kind of categorize it a little bit and how I see it. Um, and then finally, there's this quantum mechanics of curved space time, which is non-speculative, but in a regime of physics, which has never been probed, namely quantum dynamics in the presence of post-Newtonian features. 
Um, and for example, there's a very nice uh, proposal uh, by uh, Peter Graham, who we heard also Jason Hogan and, and colleagues uh, from, from 12, 13 years ago, uh, looking at uh, phase shifts and post-Newtonian corrections to the phase shifts. And so next generation atomic uh, interferometers hopefully will be able to pick that up. And then another class of uh, signatures in, 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 uh, in experiments is uh, what my uh, collaborators and I uh, worked on and proposed. Uh, and there's a sequence of works on that, which is uh, what I call a quantum interference of clocks, and namely something similar as here, except for focusing on the very specific notion of time dilation in the GR sense. And so in this talk, I will mainly focus on that uh, and talk about uh, what novel features arise there, what novel uh, um, uh, signatures uh, come about also conceptually, uh, and, and how, uh, you know, what experiments uh, can do to, uh, to, to probe. Okay, so the, uh, the overview of kind of the talk is, uh, this is maybe a bit of a optimistic overview, but as I'll say a few words on phase shifts, the microwave, and then a small detour, because this has also been mentioned, I don't want to I thought about talking more about this here, but it has been mentioned, so I, don't, I won't spend much time, but I also want to talk a little bit about our work with Juni and collaborators on clocks and how we can use them uh, to test gravitational, wave, uh, that is, uh, test gravitational waves. Uh, and then in the kind of the second half of the talk, I'll focus on this interference of clocks and proper time interferometry, introducing it, talk a little bit about how it can also lead to the coherence of composite systems and what kind of you know, experimental uh, challenges they are. And then finally, I won't have time, and this is just a different type of um, uh, uh, what, what I mentioned before, a, a different research area, which is a test of quantum gravity inspired commutative formations with optimal mechanics, but that um, I'll leave for, for another time. Okay, so uh, of course, phase shifts induced by gravity are very well known, and they're at the heart of many uh, talks we already heard uh, now in this workshop. And to, to understand it at a very basic level, it really is just the fact that uh, in the Schrodinger equation, we just include the gravitational potential. Um, and if you do that, uh, then there is a position-dependent term in the evolution, uh, if our uh, unitary evolution, which means that if we have a matter wave which has mass and it's delocalized in position, uh, then this will be a uh, superposition state with which will acquire a relative phase. And so this is assuming this, you know, all the paths are fixed, but just for simplicity, this is the core of the, uh, of the, whole, um, uh, of the whole effect. And this phase shift uh, depends on the height uh, and uh, of course on the time as how long this uh, system is in superposition. And the fact that it's observable has been uh, uh, actually noticed uh, by Colella, Overhauser and Berner the first time um, 1975. Uh, and the reason for that is even though this gravity is extremely weak, uh, the effect is divided by h bar. So you actually have a strong signal. And William Holger Müller, of course, made this point very, very nicely with the many phase shifts that you obtain. And so the first experiment was with neutron interferometer, where you just rotate the setup and you see this phase shift in 1975. Uh, and of course, now atomic fountains and matter wave interferometers, which uh, pick up this uh, gravitational phase shift, are all based on the same principle. Here, an example of like a half a meter scale fountain, or even precisely this type of setup, in fact, by um, uh, Holger Müller's group, which he uh, recently, uh, just talked about. Now, just to say the following, what do we learn conceptually about it? Because there was also a question, in fact, about it, uh, in, you know, I think, yesterday. So on the one hand, what we learn is that we can add the gravitational potential into the Schrodinger equation, just as we can add any other potential. That by itself is non-trivial. I mean, sure, we can do that, but gravity is different from other uh, uh, interactions. And so maybe it would work, but, but it does. And so everything is fine, exactly as we expect. And what we see is that the co pure quantum effect, so it's, it cannot be described classically, and it's really coherent phase induced by gravity. But what we don't learn about it is anything that goes beyond the Newtonian limit. Namely, in the Newtonian limit, everything seems simple. It's just a potential and so forth. But beyond that, uh, gravity is a metric theory. And so there's interesting questions that arise and how it would look like. And also, of course, we don't learn anything about the quantization of the gravitational uh, degrees of freedom themselves. Um, OK, so uh, what we looked at is a, a specific aspect of the metric nature of gravity, which is unique to it, and that is the time dilation. Uh, and we focused on that because it's an interesting, like I said, unique aspect, which really separates it from uh, other interactions in that gravity also changes universally the flow of time. And, you know, of course, time dilation is known gravitationally uh, very well. Uh, basically, clocks closer to a mass tick slower than clocks further away. And that is because all clocks pick up proper time, and the proper time depends on the Newtonian gravitational potential. Okay, and so this has been tested, of course, with cesium clocks, first time directly, 
uh, many years ago, and then more recently with this Trent Iron clocks on the 30 centimeter height. And the clocks are now so good that you can catch, uh, pick it up in many, uh, many experiments, even now on zoom on millimeter scale. Okay, and so a small detour uh, with this development of clocks, and I apologize, my, my kids just came home, so if it gets a bit noisy, this is the background, but um, uh, the uh, atomic uh, clocks, uh, because they're getting better and better, uh, what we studied with uh, collaboration with experimental groups of June and Amisha Lukin, uh, Ron Walsworth, also with Shimon Kolkowitz and Nicolas Michelier a few years ago, is uh, to see if they can be used at all for gradation wave detection. And at that time, it was just before the LIGO detection, in fact, um, and it was just projection about what kind of possible uh, sensitivities one could get in the next decades. Uh, but there was also interesting proposals by atomic found, uh, fountains, and you know, Jason talked about it as well. And so here we wanted to see how things would work out for atomic clocks. Um, and uh, basically, the bottom line of that study is that one can get a narrow band detector with a relatively competitive sensitivity in the sense of if you project technology into the next you know, 20, 30 years and put space, uh, but most importantly, you get a tunable uh, detector in the millihertz to hertz range using quantum control on the atoms. That's really uh, the, the interesting aspect. Um, and so just to very briefly guide through it, uh, the signal that we detect, for example, in LIGO is a light signal. And what light measures is just the effective distance between two masses. Uh, so uh, if a distance is d in flat space time, in the presence of the gravitational wave, light has to travel effectively a distance which is modulated by the uh, presence of the gravitational wave here by h of t. Um, and if the distance is, for example, much smaller than the gravitational wave, uh, uh, gravitational wave wavelength, uh, then this expression can be um, approximated, Taylor expanded, and then we get this very famous uh, strain sensitivity, namely that the change in this effective distance that the photon sees divided by total distance is directly proportional to the amplitude of radiation waves. So this is why we want a long baseline, but uh, we'll just one comment here, the long baseline, of course, only works in this limit. So at some point, the long baseline, for example, in, the, in space, it's not that important anymore. Okay, so this is measuring strain uh, uh, by changes in the optical phase. And now something similar can also be done with atoms. Uh, namely, if we have uh, the following setup, if we have like two free-floating masses, also just as uh, Lysa is proposing, and on each of them you place an optical lattice atomic clocks. And then what you do is you actually uh, uh, connect them. So you use a single laser to phase lock both clocks at one and the same laser. Then what you're doing is you're just doing a correlated clock spectroscopy between both of these systems. So you don't know total time, but you can just compare them very precisely. And this uh, cor uh, correlated spectroscopy, this link between them on it is imprinted, this precise change uh, of this gravitational wave, and how the clocks pick it up is an effective Doppler shift. So it's an effective Doppler shift instead of an effective uh, uh, phase shift that the clocks pick up. And what's interesting is that the signal for a specific Ramsey time uh, looks in the following way. So you get an effective frequency signal between the clocks, and it has two factors. One factor here is due to the, is a transfer factor due to the baseline of the system. So how's the frequency of gravitational wave compared to the distance? And the other factor, uh, and that is really, I think, one of the crucial aspects, is uh, due to the, uh, the transfer function in, in terms of how do we actually accumulate the signal at the clocks. So it depends on this accumulation time or Ramsey spectroscopy time, big T. And depending on what actually spectroscopical sequence you apply, you can change that. So what you get is you really get some kind of detector, which uh, not only operates slightly differently, but also allows you to some uh, control and change your system. And so basically your fundamental limit is atom projection noise. Um, and so uh, here, for example, for this baseline of uh, million kilometers and using strontium atoms with their coherence time, 160 seconds, um, and many, many atoms, so more atoms than we can load today. Uh, but then uh, projecting that, uh, one gets actually a sensitivity window, which is competitive uh, with, uh, with the LISA proposal. And then one can change this uh, sensitivity window by using dynamical decoupling sequ uh, sequence. And that's here, this purple one. And so one can shift this around the peak, this narrowband thing. So effectively, if one has that in space, one can shift it in, in, uh, in the frequency window. Okay, so this is kind of a small detour on that, and I'm happy to you know, answer questions about it if there's interest. Uh, but uh, uh, here, the rest of the talk, I really want to focus on something very different, namely uh, this notion of time dilation in the context of quantum mechanical matter wave interferometry. So going back to the slide, I said that clocks differently across different scales. Now, what is important is 
the clocks that we use to measure it are actually quantum mechanical systems. So there's nothing special about it. In other words, we know that the Schrodinger equation evolves with respect to proper time. So that's an experimental fact. And I don't think that has ever been really kind of uh, stressed uh, uh, clearly. Or, but, but this is actually what's happening because we know that the Schrodinger equation, the evolution of internal clock states, uh, according to quantum mechanics, is accumulated with respect to proper time because the proper time is different between different systems. So the clock mechanisms can very well be quantum and that's well tested. But what never has been tested or even probed is if the actual delocalization, localization of the system is a quantum mechanical sphere of freedom. And this is what we looked at. Uh, so this is kind of, yeah, just to put it, this is kind of in this context of quantum mechanics or curved space time or post Newtonian uh, corrections, uh, this type of clock interferometer. And the, the bottom line of this whole, um, you know, it's, there's many works and there's many follow-ups, but the, the kind of the really core is very, very simple. The core, core is the following, what we call this quantum twin paradox. Uh, namely, instead of taking two clocks, two atoms, you take a single system, like a single atom, and then you put it in superposition of two different heights. Now, on the superposition of different heights, it will evolve according to different proper times. That is the prediction by GR in the presence of mass. But the prediction of quantum mechanics is that if there is some degrees of freedom, which pick up which way you're going in the interference, then the interference will disappear. So this is the quantum complementarity principle, and namely, if there is which way information, and there is because of GR and GR only, then the interference will uh, wash out. And so really the kind of the signature, experimental signature is that there is a modulation, a change of your interference contrast, depending on if GR, how GR uh, changes your internal degrees of freedom. And so this is the interference of proper times where you effectively place a single system if being a superposition of younger and older than itself, and the experimental signature is that there is a change in the uh, path coherence. And so this is, we first uh, proposed it uh, uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, and it was inspired, in fact, by you know, some theoretical ideas by Danny Greenberger and very interesting discussions, but also by uh, 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 interesting observation of Holger Müller and his collaborators, uh, uh, Achim Peters and Stephen Chu at that time, namely about that the phase in, a, um, in an uh, optical, uh, sorry, an atom interferometer depends on the proper time. And so there was a debate about does it, you know, can one interpret this as a Compton clock and so forth? And that made us think about uh, more uh, deeply about the notion of if one has an operational clock um, that is there, what novel effects arise. And basically what really arises is entanglement and which way information that's acquired by the clock. Okay, um, so how do we capture it? And uh, this, okay, I, I'll go just very, very briefly through this. And uh, so basically what we really want to uh, study, the field is um, quantum dynamics in the presence of post newtonian corrections. So we need one of the C-square corrections to the dynamics of our systems. And what is really useful for us is of course the Hamiltonian formulation because we want to look and do quantum optics uh, with it. And so there's many different ways. We can start with the relativistic equation uh, and you know look at the relativistic energy Hamiltonian of that system. Uh, and very importantly is the following, oh, oh, okay, so this, this looks like that roughly, but very importantly is that we want a low energy limit, namely that in the rest frame the system evolves with respect to its proper time. But what is the crucial addition here, which hasn't been done previously, because of course all of this has been done in, for point particles and just masses, is the realization that one needs internal composition of the particle, an internal rest Hamiltonian, uh, such as uh, governing, for example, the uh, you know, uh, two levels and their oscillation in order to see this additional effect. And that's why it has been actually overlooked until, uh, uh, until, uh, until then. Um, and so, you know, when one does that, one obtains an effect of Hamiltonian with one of the C squared corrections, which works fine at this level. Um, and, you know, there's these uh, known relativistic corrections and GR corrections uh, that are well known. But then there's this additional term that arises, which couples these internal degrees of freedom to external degrees of freedom, namely to the relation potential and to the, uh, uh, to the momentum. And that's really just capturing the notion of proper time and that the fact that clocks as they tick, so this H0 uh, is just a, universal Hamiltonian that governs some clock, local clock evolution, that depends on proper time, and the proper time depends itself on these uh, coordinates. Okay, so this gives us a Hamiltonian to study this, um, and, you know, just for simplicity, we can forget all of these other things. We can just fix paths, uh, put uh, momentum to zero, and so forth, and then really we just end up with an effective interaction Hamiltonian between the position of the system and our internal Hamiltonian. So now we can really just do AMO physics, uh, and that makes it uh, Easy. And a different approach is to derive the same thing in the Lagrangian formulation, and this works well. 
and just it just kind of to as a side. Okay, and so the, the core is the following. Um, classically, the Hamiltonian really just captures what I said before. It's just a gravitational redshift. So if you have some internal Hamiltonian, some oscillator, uh, then you have this Newtonian uh, potential, and that's true. But then on top of that, you also have this redshift of this internal Hamiltonian as a first order correction, a uh, relativistic correction. So it's, you know the redshift is you know gx over c squared. So that's this gravitational redshift for a single system. And the difference in quantum mechanics is just simply that we put hats on it. So we quantize the position and the internal degrees of freedom, and then a new, then and only then a new effect arises, uh, uh, or this effect that we are after arises, namely uh, that this interaction Hamiltonian now entangles the path degrees of freedom and your internal degrees of freedom. So if you have not just a matter wave, but you have a matter wave with internal clock states that are also in superposition and are evolving in time, such as atomic clocks, for example, and then you split this matter wave to go either on a higher or the lower path, uh, then your effective uh, wave function is not just simply a superposition with a relative phase, but it gets entangled with the internal clock states, like I said before, because they take slower on the lower path and faster on the higher path. And this entanglement is GR induced. And so this is a, a way to see what um, kind of curved space time does on the quantum dynamics. And the signature is if you then do your interference experiment is that actually your uh, visibility of your phase uh, is now reduced. So you, not look, you don't look at the phase shift, which is just the Newtonian potential or possible corrections, but now you look at this visibility, which is really probing time dilation in, uh, in quantum front. And this depends on this overlap of your clock state. So it gives you which way information. Okay, and then, uh, Okay, I'll try to speed up. I guess I have five minutes or so. Uh, what to say is, okay, that it, it was actually, it's a, you know, a, an interesting research effort since then. Uh, so this was our first realization that, you know, this effect takes place. And this is for periodic clocks. And so if you have any clocks which take at some frequency, uh, then you get this modulation, which depends on the proper time difference that is accumulated by your matter wave in superposition. And so this is the prediction. But also effect, a bit surprisingly, but it was interesting, is to, it actually happens also for mixtures of, of periodic clocks. So if you have many, many systems and you don't actually even have uh, clocks that you can use, but even have thermal states, they will also see a reduction of visibility. And there is kind of this uh, dephasing that takes place. And this uh, can cause complete loss of coherence, uh, even in mesoscopic timescales. So that actually needs a novel coherence mechanism that has been um, you know, not known previously, and which takes place due to the background space-time inducing time dilation. And you can also test it with photons, if uh, then it's looking at Shapiro delay, not time dilation. Um, okay, uh, and now just just two words, uh, two, two slides on this edgy coherence phenomenon, and it's the same principle I asked, uh, I said before, and it relies on the fact that this H naught that I showed is so that's a local Hamiltonian is arbitrary. And for example, you can even think about, let's say you have an N modes of your system, and these are many degrees of freedom, you don't even control your internal state, you don't even think about atomic modes. Um, but instead, uh, uh, you don't even have internal coherence, so you can even have thermal state. Um, okay, sorry, my uh, yeah, my, my toddler is hungry, so I, I hope it's not too uh, too disturbing. But um, uh, anyway, so uh, there's no uh, coherence. Um, then uh, basically, one can still study the same problem, uh, and one can uh, you know see how this interaction, effective time dilation induced interaction, changes uh, uh, your dynamics of like a complex molecule that's in superposition, for example, here. And the basic outcome is that for you know just a simple model system, it doesn't depend on it, but just to to get some numbers, uh, if you have you know n harmonic modes of a molecule, say, and you place this molecule in superposition of different gravitational fields, so you just say it's in superposition, all modes are thermal, and so forth, you start off with a product state, so the center of mass is completely decoupled, uh, just in the presence of mass, uh, of a big mass like Earth, what happens is that these internal thermal vibrations uh, will actually be slowed down in exactly the same way as any other dynamics. And so you get kind of thermal vibrations which are slower, closer to the mass, and faster, further away. And that is enough to, uh, to lose coherence, and one can compute uh, this effect, and one get an effective decoherence time, and it's a Gaussian decay, it's a different, uh, different type of, it's not a Markovian uh, uh, mechanism, but you get an effective decoherence time, which depends on the many modes, so many, how many particles your system consists of, and then mostly just a lot of fundamental constants. So it's a very interesting kind of combination of a quantum effect, uh, a relativity, gravity, and, and even thermodynamics here. And so you get a decoherence time 
uh, here from this. And just to give some numbers, um, this, of course, that's the main motivation. It's really kind of the experimental questions. And here the numbers are, for example, for like a micrometer scale object on Earth at room temperature, if you can also create a micrometer or, or larger separation in, uh, in superposition vertically, then it will go here after about a millisecond. Uh, so these are extremely challenging numbers to achieve, of course, experimentally, but conceptually it's very interesting numbers because they are mesoscopic. And so kind of you get this intrinsic decoherence time just from within quantum theory in the presence of time relations. So it's a novel effect that arises when you include post-Newtonian uh, uh, effects in the Schrodinger equation. But more interestingly for experiments is this initial entanglement induced uh, 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 effect, which is that time relation induces entanglement between your controllable internal clocks, which they're very fast, uh, and the position degree of freedom. So for example, if you look at numbers such as atomic fountains, and then if on top of those fountains as we have today, you also have um, optical states which are in superposition along each path, uh, and then these, it depends on the frequency, this effect, and so they have the fa you know, optical frequencies, then you know, what's achieved is you know, something like two orders of magnitude away from when this effect will kick in. Uh, or even a bit less. So it's a factor 100 or so away. So, so really next generation atomic fountains, um, also some that we heard here, will be able to start and see this effect. And why it's interesting is because it never has the regime of physics been probed where you look at quantum dynamics and craft space. Time. And this gives you a window for doing that. And namely a particular uh, feature which is not present in electromagnetism, namely time dilation. Okay, uh, finally, uh, and this is my last slide, uh, to connect to experiments a little bit also. So all of it is very inspired by experiments, obviously, but I, you know, um, uh, there have been a lot of studies then for concretely uh, looking at experimental efforts, and it's of course challenging. But one thing to say is, uh, for example, this effect has been simulated already many years ago, um, uh, where the time relation was simulated by inhomogeneous magnetic field on spin precession. Uh, and this has, you know, has been exactly the predictions that we, we gave. You get a self-interfering clock um, in, in uh, Ron Fulman's group. Then what's very interesting is this will become relevant even in atomic clocks, uh, as John Yee talked about, as they become more and more delocalized, quantum delocalized. So there was, I'm mentioning it here because there was precisely the question I think by Jake Taylor, what is different about measuring uh, redshift just with a delocalized quantum clock and just individual systems? And this effect that I'm describing here is precisely the difference. You get an additional pure quantum effect, which is entanglement of this degree of freedom of clocks and it's put spatial uh, degree of freedom, which does not take place like, either classically nor in Newtonian physics. Um, okay, and then, you know, there's proposals uh, to, to do some uh, space-based uh, systems, but I, you know, I don't think, you know, I don't think they will fly anytime soon. And then, of course, it's very relevant, I think, for these developments that uh, um, Jason talked about, uh, for example, matches 100 for when you really start getting 10 meter uh, quantum superpositions, uh, then, you know, if, if you have a proper time difference, that's really the important point. So it's not just the high difference, you really have to uh, look at what the, the geometry is so you really can uh, capture a proper time difference between different paths, uh, then this effect will kick in. Um, and then of course, you know, this uh, setup that Holger talked about where you really hold atoms in superposition position for 20 seconds, uh, the separations here are much smaller, so the effect is not yet relevant, but hopefully, you know, in the future installments of that, one maybe could be able to probe it directly. And I hope that's the case. Okay, and with that, I, I, I apologize if I've been a little over time. Uh, so just a brief summary here. Uh, one thing was atomic clocks are interesting and they of course open new high precision frontiers. And one example is uh, gravitational wave detection, but it's not just simply that they have higher precision. They also open new possibilities for um, you know, quantum control and other type of things, which are not necessarily possible with interferometers. Uh, optical interferometers. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Jason's uh, group knows very well that in atomic interferometry, you can do something very similar. And he has you know, very, very interesting papers on that as well, which is uh, directly related to these things as too. Um, and then uh, finally, kind of the main topic here was the interference of clocks. And what I wanted to show is that there's some new effects that arise even at low energies when one combines uh, post-Newtonian gravity and quantum dynamics within the known frameworks. Um, and so we, we, we can make predictions in this framework because it's fixed gravitational background, nothing quantum about it, but then there's some new effects arise and it will be very interesting to probe them experimentally because it's really completely experimentally unprobed, this regime. Maybe things are completely different and these predictions are wrong. Uh, 
And so the, the Bain prediction is that time dilation leads to entanglement between position and parent degrees of freedom, depending on how much proper time is accumulated along each uh, superposed trajectory. And so hopefully it's relevant for, for really uh, short term next uh, future matter wave interference experiments. And also conceptually it leads to some novel decoherence mechanism, which is probably still hard to be you know, a long, long time to one be able to see it, but it's, it's an interesting um, uh, thing that appears. All right. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the great talk. Um, and I'll open it up to questions. Please raise your hand. Uh, yeah, so Lance. Hi, thanks for that nice talk, Igor. Um, I wanted to maybe take a little issue with the statement that there's no quantum field theory of gravity. I think there are lots of quantum field theories of gravity, at least effective theories. That is, uh, I don't think gravity has to be considered that, that much different from the other forces. It has a different spin, too. Uh, and uh, compared to one for the Yang Mills or other, or, or electromagnetism, but uh, you know you can treat it as a relativistic quantum field theory. The difference is that uh, it has, uh, you know, it's non-renormalizable, so you have to add higher dimension operators, and then there's some ambiguity as to how you do that. But most of that ambiguity goes away in the low energy limit. So. Uh, what yeah, you, th thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks for this remark. I, right, I mean, I completely agree, and I, I probably, you know, phrased it not very well. I, I, you, you're exactly right. I think what I what I meant to say is that we don't have a full framework that we know kind of is the correct one for sure in all trade to be consistent and kind of, you know, smoothing it all out. Um, I think it's what you're saying is very reasonable and it works to some extent, but of course there are kind of conceptual problems or, or technical problems at some level. And you know, have different approaches where some people take one or the other. So, so you're right. Let's say my main interest is really not in any way to uh, somehow to be agnostic even about what uh, what may be the correct approaches or what people prefer, and more to look at what kind of signatures arise at low energies from a, a, any of this. And I, I think the framework you described is probably the the best one even to to, to figure then, out what the signatures are. Unless there are light degrees of freedom or extra dimensions of space time or something funny. All of these theories give essentially, I think, the same predictions at low energy. And so there should be an unambiguous uh, uh, prediction from, from this theory. That's it. Right. So I think that's what I meant with this linearized quantum gravity. And if kind of these, any of these theories are good, they should give the right prediction, which we even now today know more or less. But maybe there's, you know, maybe there's surprises. And, you know, maybe yeah, I'm not sure exactly what linearized quantum gravity means. Does it mean that you don't allow uh, a graviton to uh, split? that is to interact with itself, you only allow it to interact with matter? Uh, maybe it can still interact with itself. So I don't know where the limit is. So it's kind of weak gravity. Uh, so I'm not sure, I don't recall. I think it's in this Feynman lectures of gravity where it works well until some level. And then, you know, the, at some point when this full nonlinearity of Einstein's equations has to kick in, uh, then you get into trouble. Uh, so, you know, we don't even know I mean, what the uh, if you of take freedom two, are. If you take two matter particles, so you want to scatter two matter particles, and they exchange gravitons. Uh, the, the gravitons don't have to self-interact. If you try to compute that full loop, it will also diverge. It has a divergence proportional to the square of the energy momentum tensor of the matter. So, uh, so but I guess it doesn't cause any fundamental. I mean, what I mean here is just. Well, I don't think the other divergence will cause fundamental problem. difficulties either. So, I, I mean. I'm just trying to understand what's the benefit of linearized quantum gravity over the full, uh, a full effective quantum field theory of gravity. If that's a question to me, I mean, I'm sure there are experts oh, in well, actually quantum okay. gravity who would, who would be able to comment. Okay, I thought you had worked on linearized quantum gravity. No. Uh, no, I, I worked on kind of signatures of those, such as, for example, you know, entanglement of masses okay. and so forth, where you have to look at the uh, yeah. positions of them. Okay. You, got, you got, can I, can I, I also want to, I totally support what Lance said. There's actually a very well-defined um, infrared quantum theory of gravity. In particular, there's some very nice papers by Donahue on exactly this. And there yeah. are some effects which are not at all affected by what the UV completion is. For instance, there are logs that you can compute. There are logarithmic corrections, which are quantum, true quantum gravity corrections, which you can compute 
um, independent of any uh, difficulties with UV completion, the far UV, so, so high energy processes. Um, and this is exactly analogous to what you can do in the chiral Grongen for pion interactions. Um, and so I, I recommend strongly you read these Donahue papers. Oh, I know, um, I know them, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But the signatures you get there experimentally are very small. Well, yeah, but, this, but, but that's, the, what you, that's what GR and quantum mechanics predicts. They're unambiguously small. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, but then I think my point here was uh, there's more to it than just this. And namely, there's a lot of interesting experiments that uh, interesting effects that arise at the interface uh, that, that have been missed so far. And there's still much to explore. I, I think that uh, uh, the emphasis Igor did was not on this part, because in this way, uh, I believe that maybe I uh, got it wrong, but uh, my impression is that uh, he tried to um, um, emphasize the point that, for example, clock depends on the position, you know, that your measuring device de depend. I mean, your clock depends on, say, on the height. And it's, uh, of course, uh, you can uh, refer to linearized gravity, no problem, right, with, with the However, uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the statement that, you know, uh, this, uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, influence on the measurement, I mean, how you define your clock, I mean, uh, and it is not about uh, this high energy, whatever, it's just about, you know, this time dilation, right? Sure, but my point, yeah. Arkady, is, is, yeah, absolutely, but there's a complete prediction from quantum mechanics and gravity put together. And, and in fact, that's already in the that's in the papers of of, of Jason and Peter and Mark Kasovich and um, Savas Demopoulos, the post Newtonian uh, parameters. And and okay. and and. Okay, let me jump in here because I I think that's exactly the point I want to make, which is very very important. Namely, the prediction we have here is not in these papers, precisely not because they did something wrong or something like that, but because there's an effect that's missed, which only appears if you have additional internal degrees of freedom. So the predictions you get from that uh, paper, for example, uh, is when you look at these corrections here, which are perfectly fine. But there's additional corrections that appear, uh, which entangle your internal system to external one, if your mass is not just simply a, a mass of the atom, which is what you take usually in this uh, approach, but you also allow for uh, some kind of rest Lagrangian, which allows for dynamics. So I think this is an extremely important point. I want to, uh, that's precisely the, the what is, what, um, why this effect has been missed. It is not speculative. It is not kind of postulated. It is within the same framework, just namely actually looking at it in a, uh, from, you know, a slightly, with a slight addition. No, I think that's really yeah. great. If I understand it right, you're, you're saying when you have internal degrees of freedom, you have other frequencies besides the mass of the whole system associated with the different bound states. And if, those rephase right. in a particular way, you'll change the amount of interference, I guess. Right, That's similar, right. and to entangle them as well. Exactly, yes. And you wouldn't get the entanglement just if you only had the, the rest. Mess. That's right, yeah. I think that's but, a way of... But is that some... So, just to be clear, you you were also talking about large molecules, but is this something that's visible in, in, in principle in the atomic systems too? And they haven't reached their level of precision? I missed that part. Yes, uh, ex yes, ex expression. That, that's exactly right. So um, it, it is visible. In fact, it's best visible in atomic systems, uh, probably atomic interferometers or um, you know maybe atomic clocks as well. But uh, uh, for example, here, just as an example, if you have an atomic interferometer, it would be visible if they can increase. So the height separation today is something like half a meter, meter scale uh, on a uh, kind of um, and held for maybe a, a milliseconds. And so if that can be improved by one or two orders of magnitude, this effect would kick in under specific geometries of the interferometer. Okay. So it will be directly relevant for the system, precisely like you say, similarly to this Dimopoulos uh, uh, proposal. Uh, so it's similar, it's just kind of a slight different effect which appears if you also have um, uh, this internal degrees of freedom. But you need similar scales. So maybe, you know, hopefully a 10 meter uh, separation as in Jason's uh, Fermi lab fountain that, that would matter there. But in this case, there you you think there's an unambiguous uh, specific prediction there, right? Right. So uh, yeah. okay, exactly. And the prediction is the following. So all these other things are phase shifts. So uh, sorry, I didn't even I, I didn't mention it. Uh, thanks for this question. So the phase shifts are you know this difference in probabilities of detection in these two different detectors of the output ports, and you know you have this black curve which would be Newtonian, and then post Newtonian you get this blue curve which is a bit shifted. So you get this phase shift. Uh, 
which is the usual signature. And this additional signature here is the modulation of the overall phase shift with an additional kind of uh, envelope. And it's this modulation and even the drop uh, at certain times and then revival at other times, which is the unique signature of that you know, you have this time dilation induced entanglement between the um, uh, different branches as well. But, but, but uh, Igor, uh, can, thanks a lot. Can I ask you respect to this this point? So, if this is for a single particle, so H zero is the Hamiltonian for a single atom in the internal levels. Yes. So, what about if your Hamiltonian has something that couples internal levels with external levels too? So, you or or you have a many particle Hamiltonian. Is that also going to be affected or not? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, the very short answer and probably wrong one is yes, in principle, it doesn't matter. This H naught because of universality of time relation is arbitrary. In other words, whatever dynamics you have, it will be affected the same way. However, that having said that, of course, I think many body uh, things and maybe other even um, coupling to external degrees of freedom will change the dynamics of it. And so I think it's an interesting question. And I think it would be fantastic actually to, 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 uh, to, uh, to look into it in more detail. But the short answer is the same effect will appear, but how exactly it will manifest itself depends maybe a bit more on the details. Okay, uh, Davoud? Yes, yes. Finally, I, okay, I have a two question. One is not a question. This is just my observation about the map you make to to show the branch of the physics and whatever. So, you know, that the thing is that the uh, quantum gravity, so gravity cannot be quantized as we know, like electromagnetism. The reason is that in fourth dimension, gravity is not a uh, gauge invariant. So only in lower dimension you can have this, and this is something which we 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 are not sometimes thinking about it. But for dimension, for this reason, is hard. But my second, this is the second one, is more serious maybe about the quantum mechanics in pair of space. When you super slide, when you show the the, the dynamic of particle in curved space, that's like so. Uh, if you can pass to yeah here, I think. Uh, this formula looks very handy. I, I mean, uh, you know this, you know the evolution equation which you presented. This evolution equation is not uh, Lorentz invariant, so it's still uh, is not a relativistic. It's not even uh, I don't know. It's not even see it's a, a correction to any other things. I mean, the the, the formula which you presented is uh, it's not very clear to me that you you see your 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 evolution equation for the psi is started by the proper time tau and then big field you pass to the, these equations. But this is even if you accept this, that the, the, the interaction terms make me a little worried because this if I understood that you wanted to quantize this, right? And make into format or whatever. Find the phase transition, phase the difference or some whatever. So the, this term H interaction is, you are dealing with the non-Hermitian Hamilton, as I see here. Uh, no, so first so of I do not understand, is, so I do not understand sure. how you study, how you simply talk about the quantum relations when your Hamiltonian is corrected by the some non-Hermitian terms, which- no, no, it's, uh, fully, it's fully Hermitian, it's fully Hermitian. And so this is, you start with the klein gordon equation, and then you look at the single particle sector. It's, you know, you can do the standard approach you do with electromagnetism, uh, and then you kind of, uh, you, you know, do, you, you do a full divulgence and transformation and so forth. So you can do everything standardized, exactly the same as we incorporate relativistic corrections to the, uh, uh, you know, in normal, you know, electromagnetism. This and is so the, this is the, this is, this is the same as the stackle or uh, Pyron Forman is in 1960 or something, because I work on that and I do not remember that this, this, the things goes like this simply, you know, just, uh, I, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know, but this is not the things which I, 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 it's not very familiar to me that to go just simply from the four vector with, when you didn't define it, your four vector clearly, and then just uh, simply pass to the Weak limit. There's and nothing, there's nothing then, simple about it. it. This is just a very quick summary. Yeah. Okay. Uh, weak field for you means uh, non-relativistic. Yeah, that's 
the same as no uh, we feel you just take a gr correction so g not not you expand mm, mm. so I'm, I'm happy I'll, I'll i'm happy offline i can send you some references and it might clarify so oh, thank you but, but but only to say this is of course hermitian and underlying theory is of course fully lorentz invariant so it's just kind of a useful way to to treat uh, quantum systems with corrections okay jason okay thank you, you have the next question um, oh great uh yeah thanks igor for the really interesting talk um so I have a question on the uh, proper time difference interferometry effects. Uh, so I guess the, the, the I, I guess uh, so these are like GR. You're saying GR effects due to proper time difference, and I, I guess I'm worrying about the equivalence principle. Um, basically, in the metric you gave, it's sort of a uniform acceleration due to gravity, and so I feel like I should be able to, you know, transform into a different reference frame, a freely falling frame where since it's a locally flat metric, I can get rid of gravity. And then I would talk about proper time difference in some other language, maybe in terms of Doppler shifts or something. And so, so I guess what I'm wondering is if in order to describe these effects, which I'm, I'm sure the phenomenology is, that you're describing is there, but in order to attribute them to GR, would I need to be in sort of a curved space time or, 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 or like, or in other words, I'm worried about a sort of frame dependent interpretation of this result, right? Because I can, I can go in the freely falling frame where there is no gravity. Whereas if I had a curved metric, maybe that wouldn't be. So anyway, I, I was curious on how you think about that. It's an excellent question, and uh, you know, I'm glad to clarify this. You're exactly right that, of course, you know, this effect, uh, let's say, um, arises the same way with acceleration. Uh, and the only thing it depends on is proper time. And so you can have proper time differences due to velocities, due to acceleration, and due to gravity. And then the second part is, yes, in the, if you're in the homogeneous limit here, which at small distances is fine, uh, then you can always interpret the homogeneous limit in terms of Einstein's 1907 paper. So not 1915 full GR, but it's sufficient to take special relativity, add the equivalence principle on top of it, and you get the gravitational redshift prediction. And so it's kind of a uh, special relativity plus uh, equivalence principle added to it, which is sufficient to have this expect. And I completely agree, there's nothing, um, that's exactly right. If you can push it further, uh, so the curvature does not matter for this effect on the proper time. If you can push it further, maybe you can make it unambiguous GR. But to just say, uh, but but I would say it's exactly the same as any other test of GR that tests the gravitational redshift. So, you know, if you, if you talk about gravitational redshift as one of the pillars of a uh, test of GR, which Einstein also labeled, it is actually a test of this 1907 prediction. And so we can always go into a frame where this is just special activity, and this is fine. But that's only true for this homogeneous limit. And in fact, I hope really to, we were just finishing a paper where we show how you can really increase the distance tremendously by looking at entangled systems. And then you, then one can, you know, attribute this purely to GR as well. And, and would you want to be in that limit in order to, to sort of make claims about quantum effects and curved space time? And you'd need to see some curvature in order to say that, I guess. Would you agree? exactly? So this is not an effect due to curved space time because the curvature does not enter, uh, but it's the effect. I would I, I phrase it as effect with post newtonian corrections or the GR notion of proper time. And so, sure, you can go to a regime where you also have curvature, and uh, for the pre you know, maybe we don't know, you know, maybe, maybe it matters, but from the formulas we have today, it does, you know, it doesn't matter. It only the proper time work line matters. And so you're right. Uh, that will be interesting too. But I think uh, kind of conservatively, I, I'm, I'm comfortable calling it like GR and QM overlap because it's in exactly the same spirit as classical tests of GR. And so sure, going to curvature is interesting and will be even better. But for, for this particular effect, it's sufficient to have this kind of uh, proper time uh, uh, contribution due to mass. Great. Thanks so much.